camera. Les gens qui ont du mal à se connecter. Mathias, yeah. shall we make a five-minute yeah. preparation for the breakout? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see the screen. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So, Maria Grasa da Cavallo doesn't see the item for camera or microphone. Yes, Peter, I, I just saw that Maria entered as an attendee. I'm making her a presenter. Ah, uh, okay. She. Okay. Excellent. So maybe, Maria, could you try again like this? Now you're a presenter. Yes, can you? Uh, no. But. But we don't hear you. I only hear you via the phone. Ah, ah now it's loading. Okay, yeah. perfect. It starts in okay. 20 seconds. Be ready. Can, can you wait a second? It, sorry, <laughs> we... the platform doesn't work well, so it's a, it's a confusion. Maria, we hear you very well, and unfortunately, it will open automatically. But don't worry, we hear you very well, and we see you. So it goes, goes live in seven seconds. Good luck. The people that are on the on the panel, they say that it's everything okay, that they can see and hear me. Okay, that's strange. Let me let me check with you. Check my again. One second. One second. Ada. Ada. Can you see there, me, Peter? There's, there's yeah. Issues with the sound actually in the room. And and can you hear me? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Can Kassel, I think it's open. You can open the, the session. IT is calling me. Yeah, because the IT is calling me saying that they cannot hear you and see me. But if you can ah. hear and see, it's okay. Yes, Kassel, are, I think you are, you, are, you are not in the room, no? I am. My colleagues are, Peter ah. Droll is saying that they can, he can hear me and see me. So I can open the session. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, but you are in the room or you are connecting remotely? I connect remotely. Okay, because I see in the platform that your camera is uh, is locked out, like, uh, like it, no. it, it's not... Uh, it's locked in, they can see me. Okay, okay. I'm gonna tell the coordinator and we will do a test then. Okay, can I start? Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me check... Uh, Sure. Carvalho Maria, she wants to, uh, to check because she said she can see her camera and everything is working. So I don't know why we, we can see the camera disabled. Yeah, she says she can see, she can see herself. That's it. Strange. Yeah, exactly. Let's test. Okay, we are going to do a test, Miss Carvalho. Uh, we are going to open the... the microphone for you and we are going to do a test okay okay and where can i start uh, so we are going to open uh, your speak button uh, and then you can uh, press speak and we will see here in the room if we can see you but 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 my microphone is on at the moment okay 
let me uh, let me check with my colleagues and okay. uh, um, I will call you back. Okay. Okay. Uh, the audience is saying that yeah. they can hear me and see me from the chat. So I, I'm going to start. Okay. 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 Maybe it's because. Uh, because between devices we can we can hear ourselves. There's no problem, but there's a problem in the room. We cannot hear. We cannot hear in the room. We cannot hear uh, remote participants in the room. But but I, I'm receiving message that people are. Everyone can see me, and everyone is listening to our conversation. So it means that is working. So I'm going to start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, I'm, try I'm, try. I'm, that uh, okay, everything keeps you. like this. Okay, okay, okay. It's okay. Fine. Uh, I will check with my coordinator. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much thank for you. your worries. So, but I, I think this no is okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So, good morning to all. Uh, I apologize for the difficulties, the technical difficulties, but uh, let's hope that everything okay. I'm. Uh, I think it will because now we are, you can see me, you can hear me. So, uh, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, thank um, and to give a really a give thank to uh, my uh, good friends of DGRTD that have invited me to moderate that very interest, uh, interesting uh, debate. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure for me to introduce the core elements that characterize this uh, um, debate on clean steel and transport. Um, Europe moves green. I'm myself a mechanical engineer, so as you can understand, I feel quite uh, happy to uh, moderate a debate on real engineering. Um, and I thank for, for choosing me, uh, the ones that have choosing me for this. As you uh, all know, the, the current growth and the agenda, the agenda for growth of the European Union is based on two fundamental issues, the Green Deal and the digitalization. The transition to, to a more uh, resilient uh, and uh, clean uh, economy um, is uh, uh, very much based on research and innovation, only with an intensive uh, investment uh, of uh, research, new technologies, application of this technology and innovation, we will be able to do this double transition that should be done in parallel and uh, uh, taking in consideration with uh, each other, the transition for uh, greening and the digital transition. And the steel sector uh, is, a, is a very good example. It's a challenge example, but it's a very good example. Not only the steel sector, but all the sectors that depend uh, on uh, steel. Uh, such the, the transport, mari um, uh, maritime, uh, aviation, aerospace, transport in general, but also the industry, the other industrial sectors that so much depend on steel. And they are uh, perfect examples where uh, the European Union needs to focus uh, more efforts as the challenge uh, must be, are more difficult than in other uh, industrial and economy sectors. Um, President van der Leyen uh, cited the importance of the production of clean uh, steel in her speech on the State of the Union. It was very inter interested uh, in a very political uh, speech our president has uh, mentioned this, uh, this sector as an example of a lighthouse European projects that are needed, uh, projects with a high impact. And she uh, even mentioned uh, the potential of the hydrogen uh, to support uh, uh, our industry and also the steel sector with a new uh, clean license uh, uh, to operate. Um, it's a fact the union needs to maintain its competitiveness 
uh, its economic competitiveness. And uh, for that, we need to invest in uh, low carbon technologies that can make the difference. Uh, to, modern, to modernize our clean steel production is going to be a very big challenge for all of us. And the a very important investment and emphasis on new technologies, research, innovation, pilot scale, demonstration projects uh, are required. Uh, this can be done through the, um, the help uh, uh, or the co-financing of our most important uh, programs in research and innovation, such as the uh, Horizon Europe uh, to the programs more devoted to investment, like the Investment U and the Next Generation Funds, also the European budget um, with the regional funds that can also uh, provide financing to this uh, large scale uh, project that are necessary. We need a set of innovative ideas, research and demonstration projects to help our industries to become more cleaner, more sustainable and uh, competitive. Um, because we want to compete with high tech uh, products. And in this case, we really need to have a strong high tech, low carbon solutions for the production of clean steel and for all the sectors using steel, such as the transport uh, and the aerospace. And it's exactly this, how we are going to uh, achieve these high-tech, low-carbon solutions for the production and use of steel that is the main subject of the debate today. Um, so how we are to organize this debate? Uh, we have uh, three main experts in the panel. Uh, and I'm also glad to communicate that we have around 100 participants connect, among uh, which we have 25 high-level industrial representatives. Uh, and uh, we have, in certain way, we are we have organized the debate in two parts. Um, the first part is going to be dedicated to the speakers' presentations, while the second part. Uh, is reserved to the debate and uh, we have the possibility to 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 answer it. The, the speakers will answer to uh, questions that will come from the audience. Uh, I will be moderator of the first part, the part of the three speakers, while the Q&A session, uh, uh, we have the honor uh, to, to have a prominent and very well-known uh, European Commission director from DG RTD, uh, Peter Dro, a, a very good friend, long-time friend, and uh, an expert in all the fields um, of industry. Um, Peter Dro does need a, a long presentation, and as you might have had the chance to have to get in touch with him, with him and his work in the past, uh, as I said, uh, Peter Droll has an extensive experience in the areas of innovation, uh, social innovation, industrial policies, including uh, steel. The steel sector doesn't have secrets for him. So we have a force expert in our. Uh, in our debate, not only the three speakers, but also our moderator of the debate. Um, we will have the opportunity to collect questions from the audience through the live chat. And, and uh, I invite uh, all of you to write your questions while Peter uh, will do his best to raise uh, these questions uh, to the panelists. Uh, for them to respond and to uh, to debate also among themselves. Uh, but uh, it's enough for the presentation of the panel. Now let's uh, go down to business and move to the first speaker. 
I'm quite happy to see that the organizers decided to have a women first. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to introduce Mrs. Clevin. Um, and Mrs. Clevin is the uh, chairwoman of Sea Europe, the voice of the maritime, civil, and naval industries in Europe. Um, as investor in Norwegian shipbuilding, uh, she has served as elected representative of the maritime technology sector at national and European level um, uh, for several years. She is also a co-founder of Prodtex uh, since 2018, specializing in automated design and construction of steel bridges. Uh, Mrs. Clevin, the floor is yours, and let me remind you that you have seven minutes for your presentation. And uh, I, I'm sorry that I need to be uh, quite strict uh, with time, as we will have an intense debate of, uh, in front of us, and unfortunately we lost uh, some minutes with the technical problems in the beginning. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I hope you can all hear me and it's okay now. Um, I will uh, start by saying thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about how two major industrial sectors in Europe can meet its societal objectives to contribute to a greener future. The numbers on the screen now is just a few numbers showing the importance of the blue economy and the position of shipping and the maritime technology sector when it comes to transport. We are global industries with fierce global competition. I think that's also the case for steel. This also means that how the European players of the maritime industries are dealing with the climate challenges is crucial to the world. The shipyards and the ship equipment suppliers are themselves directly employing almost 700,000 skilled workers or engineers. It is therefore Crucial, also crucial to Europe that the maritime technology sector is able to do the green transition and I think in that way keep our global leading technological position. And of course these days, in addition, we have to overcome the impact of COVID-19 which has hit this sector very hard. Um, the European waterborne transport community has given itself a big goal to provide and demonstrate zero emission solutions for all main ship types and services within 2030. Many of these technologies are already there and many are in our laboratories. Collaboration and unified research agenda are key. And therefore, in Sea Europe, we are very happy to observe that both the steel and the waterborne sector have been selected for a candidate partnership in the framework of Horizon Europe. The European Partnership for Clean Steel, which supports EU leadership in transforming the steel industry into a carbon neutral industry, serving as also as a catalyst for other strategic sectors. And our European Partnership for Zero Emission Waterborne Transport aims at enabling Europe to lead and to accelerate the transformation towards zero emission maritime and waterborne, um, also uh, both uh, uh, also inland waterborne transports. There is not one solution that will reduce emissions from ships, and today there is a buffet of initiatives taken. This list shows that the road to zero emission shipping is cross-sectoral. The ship owners are fine-tuning their logistics and planning to reduce fuel consumptions in, in the existing fleet. And fuel itself is at the core of the R&D happening uh, for future vessels. And some new fuel solutions are all, already commercialized. And a number of alternatives and hybrid solutions are discussed and tested as we speak. With new fuel, you also will need new engine and other ship equipment, and this equipment itself is very important for, for effective uh, uh, ship, uh, uh, ship operation. And of course, steel is a significant part of a ship. Steel as material has many big advantages, but also two significant disadvantages, and that is its weight and its carbon footprint. And we need to reduce the weight of our vessels to reduce emissions. Therefore, our designers and our naval architects are doing what they can to make the hull as dynamic as possible and to equip the ship in the best manner to use the steel efficiently. 
A key to reach our ambitions is also to make use of new automated digital technology, as already mentioned in the introduction, in the production processes of ships and equipment. I think only by implementing what is called Industry 4.0 technology in manufacturing, we can take big steps in greening of shipping. A simple example of this is how robotized welding leave a significant smaller footprint than manual welding. And new te production technology also enables new designs and less material. And of course, I have to underline, I still want your steel, but I, will, I think it will also secure your future as steel sector if you also can help us, the shipyards and other big steel spenders, to use steel in a smarter way. And finally, it goes without saying that to achieve this, we need the best skills, be it the skilled, best skilled workers, naval architects, or even management. And these skills, they need to be renewed and updated. The environmental footprint of an industry depends heavily upon the footprint also of its value chain. You must not only do your own homework, you will also have to encourage and even demand that your supplies that your suppliers do theirs. The steel sector will have to radically rethink its production processes from well to product. And we expect and we trust the European steel mills to be the front runners um, in low carbon solutions. We expect it to be a competitive, a competitive advantage for us to use European steel in our vessels. And we are encouraged by seeing the full-scale pilot of the hydrogen-powered steel mill in Finland. We also appreciate the high amount of recycled material in the steel from some European mills. Combined, combine this with shorter transport distances, and that gives us good arguments to use European steel. This will have direct effect on the triple bottom line that will be asked by our customers, also by our owners and by governments, I think, in coming years. To meet societal challenges such as the European Green Deal, research, development and innovation will be key in order to demonstrate, develop and produce deployable technolo uh, technological solutions. More than ever before, sectors will need to come out of their silo thinking and start collaborating with each other. And for us to make use of all the advantages of steel, the steel sector must help us to avoid the disadvantages. I will finish by reminding you that we will need a little, bit, little help from our friends in governments too. A good place to start, in addition to doing good R&D policies, of course, is to make the environmental footprint a significant part of your criteria when you specify public, public purchases, such as car ferries, bridges, or other public, uh, public constructions where steel is the preferred material. Thank you. That will... Uh, be it for me now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. We took a, a very important message uh, out uh, of your uh, um, uh, presentation. Uh, the whole val uh, value chain from hill to well to market to come out of the silo thinking, very important for all of, all of us and for the public uh, um, authorities to take into consideration the environmental footprint in public procurement. Uh, I myself as a MEP in charge in the INCO on the public procurement, I took it very good notice of your, your message. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for taking the uh, the, to, to be strict on time and we go now to our second presentation and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, my pleasure to announce uh, Mr. Tommaso Guidini um, and um, from, uh, from the European Space Agency uh, Mr. Guidini is the head of materials uh, technology se uh, section at the agency and he has obtained his uh, uh, PhD in uh, experimental and numerical structural me uh, mechanics in the Institute of Materials Research of the German Aerospace Center. Uh, Mr. Guidini, we are very uh, keen to listen to you and please stick to your seven minutes for your speech. Uh, and I think that uh, also you have a, a, a short video. So 
uh, that you we will see the next generation of the youth transport. Mr. Guidini, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, so it's Peter speaking. I have the impression that uh, there is a connection problem. Perhaps we start with Mr. Caldonazzo uh, and while waiting for the connection. Anyway, I think now we need to give the floor to the, the, the so. speaker because they, they are waiting as well. So okay, we can I start then? Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't see the slide. My slides. I don't know if, it, uh, if they are charged or not. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Guidini, can you hear me? Mr. Guidini? Um, is uh, Mr. Mario uh, Caldonazzo uh, online? Because we could go to the presentation of Mr. Caldonazzo and come back to Mr. Guidini afterwards. Is, is Mr. Guidini or Mr. Caldonazzo online, please? Uh, Peter, Peter Droll, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Is I hear Mr. you very well. I hear Mr. you very well. Caldonazzo or Mr. Guidini, one of them online? Now on my screen, they're all both disconnected. Hmm. What we, yeah. Yes, we could uh, uh, start asking if we have some questions to Mrs. Clevin and uh, start a bit of the debate with the presentation while we try to fix the IT systems, tries to fix the connections with the, um, with the other two speakers. Yes, there are two questions directly to you, Ms. Clevin. Um, there is a colleague who would like to know if there is any way uh, a software company developing shipbuilding CAD and SAM, CAM and monitoring, um, which monitoring can support the green initiatives of the EC. Can you see that question? Software? Um, software. Well, what, uh, if, if so, uh, once more, please. If software. If, if, is there a software company developing shipbuilding CAD and CAM, computer animated design, um, which would help to uh, um, be the green initiatives in shipbuilding? Uh, well, of course, there are uh, there are designer tools and our, our software tools that are especially. Um, uh, used by by ship designers and naval architects. Uh, there are big, uh, big firms um, uh, that that are uh, that are supplying these. Um, and what is now, now uh, um, many are working on is to use the so-called digital twins to have the connection from the design and you design in the 3D 
uh, tools with the 3D tools, and, and you have the digital twin of the of the vessel from from the construction or from the design phase until until the the finished vessel in in the production, which is um, which is a, a helpful tool for for the for the uh, efficiency of the of the construction process, but also with which helps us uh, very much to to reduce uh, to avoid mistakes <laughs> in the production, but also to to have the right use of materials and and also find the the right way of of the the vessel. So so the software is is of course important. Uh, but I don't uh, uh, want to specify any, any uh, uh, concrete suppliers. But of of course that will uh, that is also an area of where, where we uh, work on on the to, to have better tools also in in and, and that's a part of the research agenda also. Yeah, good. I see that Mr. Gedini is at least connected. But with, um, we have still one more question for you. Um, and that is, it's good to hear that the maritime sector is willing to use EU steel <laughs> considering its footprint. But the question is, what about the price of steel? How important is the price? Of course, the price is, is important. Everything, the, uh, building a, a vessel is very, very complex. And there is very many, many elements that have to come together. And finally, on the bottom line, it is the it is the price, but we I think also for the for the future the customers will also um, slowly ask for uh, for more dimensions from the from their ships than uh, not only the price, but they will also uh, uh, more and more also put weight on the on the environmental side of their uh, of their vessels, how they run their vessels themselves, but also how the vessel is produced and the value chain behind it. So, but I think that is um, uh, that is something that will will de is developing already slowly, and you see some some ship owners being more concerned about that now. But um, yeah, thank you. That was very clear, um, Grasa. I wonder whether we have one of our speakers now yes. lined up. I don't see them actually. Um, Mr. Gidini, are you online or uh, Mr. Caldonazo? Um, while we're waiting, can I put a question to Mrs. Clevin? Um, I don't know uh, if you are familiar with our research and innovation programs, Horizon 2020 or uh, which will be the future Horizon Europe that we are now finalizing the negotiations between the Parliament and the Council uh, with the assistance of the and the, the European Commission. Uh, and if you have uh, any recommendation for is it well adapted to uh, the industrial sectors like uh, your own or the steel making itself, or it will be any recommendation that you will give us. Uh, for the for the last uh, <laughs> bit of the negotiations uh, and still possible improvement of what we have on the table. Well, the clear recommendation from Sea Europe must be that our application for a CPP on on the waterborne uh, on 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 zero emission waterborne transport that that's it that is accepted. That would be really <laughs> the best recommendation I can give you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I can I follow up on this question? Yes. Um, we have for a long time heard that it's very important for industry to have a clear and stable framework for their investments. Mm. And I'm I'm around for quite some time. I've never had a, a, a period where the Commission started with one single project, which is so well known and giving a clear direction. So in my view, with the Green Deal. And, and the twin transition gas I mentioned, um, the investment conditions and the direction of travel of all policy is clearer than ever. Do you see that as well? And does it help you in your investment decisions? Talking about the footprint of steel, the footprint of the maritime sector, etc. Mm. Well, uh, <laughs> 
as a direct uh, investor in, in shipbuilding, it's uh, of course many elements uh, as we speak today because the, the sector is also so heavily hit by the COVID-19 situation. So, and we are also uh, in such a fierce international um, competition, not the least from, uh, from, uh, from the Asian competition. It's very hard, uh, very strong for the European shipyards. So uh, it's not only a question of R&D and how we can uh, how we can uh, go forward on on that side uh, but i think uh the uh, it's a very important chance for europe to uh, that we have to stay be the front runners in the new gre in the in the new technology and combining as was said in, in the introduction combining the green deal challenges with the, also the new technology that is uh, that must be the answer for us and we have to now put the effort on being front runners and and keep our global position through that i think mm -hmm. and then of course in addition there is a lot of Can you other trade trade uh, trade issues that is also uh, but that's another political <laughs> political field i think but uh, but uh, to have a, a real global uh, real level uh, uh, level playing field globally that yeah. is also of course a very important part when you talk about investing in our in our industry yeah thank you Gasta, i can hear and see mr gadini ah okay so mr gadini could you please start your presentation? Yes. We can see the slides. Is it Mr. Gidini? Can Mr. Gidini hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Ah, yeah, good. <laughs> Very welcome. <laughs> Please. Okay, good morning. Uh, I hope it works and it stays stable. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry if I created any problem to you. It's a great pleasure here and giving you the perspective on clean steel and materials and structures for space. So um, I hope, can we move to the next slide? Am I moving to the next slide? Probably yes. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm just afraid that you lose me. So very quickly about the European Space Agency, actually it's Europe's getaway to space. We are supported by 22 member states. We have 5,000 employees, a budget of around 6 billion euros per year. That translates into a 12 euro per European citizen per year. Um, we have seven sites across Europe and, of course, our spaceport in French Guiana. Our objective is the peaceful use of space for exploration and technology development. Now, uh, what I would like to tell you is, first of all, if you are not familiar with the space material, I can tell you, with the space environment, I can tell you that space is the most demanding and hostile environment that materials and structure can, let's say, experience, so that engineering products can experience. You have to imagine that this, ironically, this uh, environment starts on Earth, meaning it starts from manufacturing. Our structures, our materials are exposed, first of all, of all to the manufacturing, to the assembly, to the workmanship, then you have to test it on ground. Actually, the most aggressive environment is probably the qualification testing on ground for the materials and structure. Then you have to launch it. In the launch phase, you have vibration, acoustics, um, loads, shocks, thermal fluxes, then burst strikes, lightning strikes. So very, very, let's say, demanding ride to get to space. Once you are in space, the loads get off, of course, because you are in zero gravity, but then it starts a completely different environment that is radiation, uh, vacuum, uh, high cosmic uh, and, and solar protons that comes against your spacecraft. Then, of course, you have the temperature variation while rotating around the Earth, or if you go to a specific planet, you have very high or very low temperature, especially if you are entering the planet. So all of this is happening to your material sense. We have to face this extremely demanding environment, but we have challenges in the material supply chain. First of all, 
we have an omnipresent requirement that is the need to lower the mass and to lower the volume. That's for sure our out, let's say, overarching requirement. Second, we have to guarantee extremely high performances on very demanding scientific missions that have to work in the environment I just described, very aggressive. They have to work there for at least maybe 15 or 18 years, and we have no repair or no maintenance options. Once you have launched a, a satellite to the sun, that's you cannot touch it, you cannot bring it back, you cannot maintain it, you cannot repair it. On all of this, we have very often very small and very complex structures that are to be manufactured. And the irony is that we don't have the power or the weight, if you want, of the aeronautic industry or the automotive industry where we can ask for specific alloys. We have not that weight because our volumes, production volumes, are rather limited. Hence, we have to guarantee these very high performances in this very aggressive environment but we have a very limited, uh, let's say, weight on the definition of new alloys, definition of processes. And then we are even further limiting these opportunities, manufacturing opportunities, with the REACH and ROS uh, regulation that are actually further impacting our supply chain. So this is a bit the scenario in which we work. Uh, if you are interested in reading more, there is a, a paper in Nature Materials from myself. Maybe you can have a look. And there is described in details what is for us the environment in which we, be, we move. Steel specifically, where do we use steel? Well, steel is very much used in our, let's say, environment. We have, first of all, uh, applications. Well, the classical steels that we use are 300 alloys, 400 alloys, then 15.5 pH and 17.5. Do you see it? I lost the presentation. <laughs> We okay. see you, anyway. no problem. <laughs> okay, okay, so I continue. So, 17.5 uh, pH, 17.4 pH, 15.5 pH, all of them are used now simplifying. We use them in structures manufacturing, launch structures manufacturing, very much in propulsion systems, starting from pipelines, valves, um, tanks, so all of the rockets engine, all of the propulsion system is done in uh, very often in steel. And then we have very much mechanism. So all what moves in a satellite or in a rocket is normally done in steel. So this is, let's say, uh, a material that is very, very much used in our uh, structures. The problem is that originally our, our volumes were, were very limited. It was like shipbuilding, like a luxury ship, one, but with all the technologies you can imagine. Now, though, more and more, because of the mega constellations kicking in, especially in navigation, earth observation, and telecommunication markets, we are moving more and more towards, if not an automotive way of maybe an aeronautical approach where you have a, a volume that increases. So we have an opportunity here that is trying to spin in manufacturing from larger manufacturing domains, like aviation and automotive, uh, opportunities to optimize our own supply chain and our own way of producing, getting green or, let's say, greener. So I'm very proud to tell you that the European Space Agency was actually taking the lead in trying to reduce our carbon footprint and of the space missions. So on one side, one could say, OK, your volume is so limited that you should not care too much or you should not be worried too much because your manufacturing is so small that you are not impacting that much the planet. Well, no. First, because as I said, the mega constellation, the volumes are growing, space economy is kicking in, so the volumes are growing, first. Second, as an agency, we wanted to give the example because we thought if we show, let's say, an example, maybe we have further buy-in from other large or much larger markets that think of saying, okay, we need also ourselves <laughs> to do something. It's very important. So then we kicked out two very important to us programs that are called Clean Space and Advanced Manufacturing, exactly with that objective. So trying to get our emissions and manufacturing processes cleaner while trying to guarantee the same performances or even topping the performances of our pre previous, let's say, uh, technologies. Hence, we propose few things, and here I'm listing some of them, 
to try to reduce the footprint in manufacturing of steel or in application of steel. First of all, we do an LCA, life cycle assessment, for all our missions. It's mandatory, both on flying missions as well as research activities. Second, it's not just the steel the problem, it's also the passivation of the steel that to us is a problem, so the surface treatment. Hence, we want to move from nitric acid passivation going to citric acid passivation, so using lemons to try to passivate the surface whilst guaranteeing the same performance of the material. But also, we try to look into the manufacturing processes, like, for example, I quote some of them, ad additive manufacturing, you are not removing materials, hence you are not wasting material, you are only using the material you need. So instead of having wasting of 75%, with additive manufacturing, you can waste 5%. Hence, you reduce the material need, you optimize the design, you design only what you need and not what you need to manufacture, but what you need to do the mission. You reduce the transport of the material, you reduce the number of recycling loops, hence you reduce significantly your CO2 footprint. We try to also change the welding processes, going to solid welding instead of like liquid welding or, or let's say uh, the traditional welding while reducing the chemistry needed, the chemical uh, elements needed. And then also we try to optimize the smart manufacturing approaches, reducing and optimizing our supply chain, reducing the manufacturing step, reducing the, man the maintenance and the consumables, having virtual storage, for example, so knowing where the already produced uh, steel elements are and buying them instead of remanufacture something that we have already available. That's another smart manufacturing application. And then if you want to go to another planet you and, and settle, this is the future of probably, I hope, humanity going to the moon and create a moon base and even going maybe to Mars and create a Mars base. If you want to go these missions, you have to get used to the systematic recycles, hence recycling. Hence we are now developing recycling routes for steel, so to have also on Earth recycling as a fundamental and systematic technology to be used in order to reduce our footprint and our consumables. And with this, I thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. We got some very important message that you received uh, technology from other sectors like automotive and aeronautics, but you have a, a lot of spillover uh, from your uh, advancements to uh, many sectors of the economy. Uh, even your the space economy is not uh, huge, it's small, but it's growing. And what you do has a lot of impact on the other uh, other sectors and many sectors of the economy will use the advancements that are done in space and also the LCA for all your missions, the systematic recycle things, learn, lessons that we can learn for uh, other sectors of the industry and the economy in general. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I think our third uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Caldonazo, are still having problems. Uh, can can Mr. Caldonazo hear us? No. So I, I will pass the the word to uh, Peter Draw that uh, can do now a short debate because we have very few minutes uh, to see if we have some questions special to to our previous speaker and uh, uh, before I just do a short conclusion. Peter, please. Thank, thank you very much, Gasta. So we have two important questions for, for which we can spend two minutes, not more. The first one is whether there will be a change to ship scrapping to support greening of the steel industry. That's for, for you. Uh, and the other one is probably more for us. Um, what are the concrete systemic measures we would do from the EU side with um, taxation, quotas, or contracts for difference for clean, uh, clean steel and green uh, fuel? So I'll come to that briefly after, after Kirsty on the steel scrapping. 
Uh, yes, I think we experience now that this is uh, gets uh, uh, every day a hotter issue, and and uh, the, there is um, um, uh, scrapping of of ships is a uh, is a very important important issue. Also, uh, because of the the societal side of it, and and uh, it's a, it's an important issue for many European shipyards also, and they are especially uh, shipyards also dealing with with um, conversions and and uh, uh, repairs are also many of them are looking into into this and also it's it is a political discussion how we can support the the, the development of, of scrapping scrapping so should there be some subsidy or some support for for ship owners giving uh, in their own uh, their old vessels which can also be a part of a, a renewal scheme for for european shipping so um, it is uh, an ongoing uh, ongoing di uh, discussion yes and Thank also uh, of course uh, uh, the, uh, the circular economy is very it will is a very important part of the of the greening of of economy in general yeah Thank you for that very important point, and also thank you for the colleague who, who raised that issue. Uh, something which is, as you say, um, uh, if we want to go for the economy, a crucial thing to solve. So, as regards the systemic support foreseen uh, by, by the EU, um, a year ago, it um, there were only one or two voices calling for carbon border adjustment tax. Uh, and our president has completely changed the picture and put that as a priority. Um, so uh, that will come as soon as possible. I, I can't give a, a deadline, um, but uh, this is an important change in approach and important for us to be able to move to the green production of steel and fuel without losing um, our competitiveness uh, or without losing production here in, in, in Europe. Um, as regards quotas, for me, this is the last resort. I would not um, uh, I would not um, um, push uh, quotas too much. I would rather uh, s um, uh, propose incentives. Um, we mentioned partnerships where we have uh, for investment. Uh, we, we're working on this industrial alliance uh, where we look at global value creation systems, um, bringing uh, value chains to Europe while keeping uh, openness to third countries. So that is the approach that we are following here. And with that, knowing the time constraints, I hand over and back to you, Rosa. But by saying how much impressed I was by the two presentations, it was really inspiring. It's based as a luxury ship <laughs> with the <laughs> ship sector, um, the same challenges, weight, um, maintenance, uh, harsh environments, materials. This is something very important. So I do hope that you also um, make best use of our investment priorities coming up with Horizon Europe under the part of digital industry and space. Thank you so much, Grasa. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, just to conclude, I take mainly three messages. The first, how, uh, how vital is still for all these sectors, mainly the transport sectors, but not only. We all agree of the importance of the research, uh, technology, innovation for the steel industry and for the uh, sectors that apply the steel, that we need to take in consideration all the technologies uh, uh, available and we need to have an horizontal approach to, to, uh, uh, to the issue. And third message, uh, that we need to have to look at the, the, the all the sectors in a holistic way uh, to consider the circular economy and to perform a, a, a LCA in order to have a full picture of the carbon footprint. So uh, three very important message for the policymakers and for the industrial sectors. I thank very much the two speakers. I apologize very much from the for the IT uh, problems that we have. It shows that uh, we still need to invest in digitalization <laughs> like our... <laughs>
<laughs> president has told us, and uh, we fully agree. We really need to to invest more in digitalization uh, because on the hard and linear, probably we, we are uh, doing better. Our uh, our uh, space. Uh, 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 craft and our ships uh, uh, do not have uh, so much problem as the IT still have. Uh, we hope uh, so. Uh, with that and apologizing uh, to to all of you for these troubles in the communication, I thank also Peter Draw uh, and the speakers. Uh, the third speaker, if you can hear, Mr. Caldonazo, also that tried to enter all the time. Uh, and all the audience for uh, uh, the possible interest uh, uh, debate that we had. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have the, the third speaker, but it was in any way a, a very interesting hour that passed very quick. And thank you all and have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.